So we started to talk about this individual and uh, we talked him about, about him being um, the lie. Not a lie, but the lie. It's a noun, it's a personal pronoun. And we discuss it as we get to the very last topic here in, in, in a few weeks' time. Uh, he's the great deception. Um, we talked about him being Jewish. We talked about him being Syrian. We talked about him uh, having so many uh, wonderful, so to speak, characteristics as an individual, it's very easy to see why he is the delusion. It's very easy to see why he is the lie. Very easy to see why people would yield to and succumb to him. Because the guy is a genius. Now, he's not doing it in his own power. He's doing it by the power of Satan and by the, um, uh, the cooperation of a false prophet. Somebody want to just turn to um, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation the 13th chapter, uh, and if you'll just read verses 1 through 3, that will sort of um, nail that concept down so that um, Revelation chapter 13, and we go 1 through 3, if somebody would do that. So the dragon, as you read in chapter 12, was Satan gave him his power. So this individual is getting help. Uh, I mean, phenomenal amount of help. And uh, later on, you'll read in chapter 17 of Revelation, they do lying signs and wonders. It's also in chapter 11. They do lying signs and wonders. They do all sorts of stuff to counterfeit what God did through the Messiah, through the genuine Messiah. And so he's a counterfeit in every, every which way. So the last time we were together, just before Christmas, we took up just the genius of the Antichrist and how intelligent this particular individual is. We took up his, uh, his intellectual genius. We're going to talk today about his oratory genius. And we do his political, his business, military, his lobbying genius, his governmental genius, and his religious genius. And um, the guy is exceptional in all of these arenas. We talked last time about his intellectual genius, where the scriptures tell us in the book of Daniel that he had the eyes of a man. You say, well, most all men have eyes, but that's not what it was referring to. When you go to the scriptures, and it, 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 the scriptures turn to or allude to eyes, it's always talking to the intellect. For example, Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, as he prays for the church in Ephesus, says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened or illuminated. And um, the Bible says in Second Corinthians 4 about, the, um, about Satan who blinds the minds of them. It's all optic. And so it talks about your intellect, your knowledge, your, your awareness. And so this guy has the eyes of a man. He's, he's, he's got the intellect, human intellect, that was just beyond most people. In fact, we read how he was able to answer um, secrets, dark sentences. Um, and we took that up how, uh, back in Kings, 1 Kings chapter 11, how the, the Queen of Sheba, when she came to uh, Solomon, do you remember that story? And the Bible says she came with hard questions, and he answered them all. They had heard of his wisdom, and, and they came with these riddles or hard questions, and Daniel was, or, um, Solomon was able to answer them all. Well, this individual, the Bible says in the book of in Daniel, he does the same. He's able to solve and bring solutions to issues. He's able to answer and give understanding to what were hard riddles or difficulties in humanity or society. And as a result of that, his intellect is, is going to be outstanding. And again, one of those reasons that the scientific world or the mathematical world or the, you know, the, the, the world of... of, of biologies or whatever science it is, whatever level of education it is, will be drawn to the guy because he'll be outstanding as far as his intellect is concerned. This morning I want to address his oratory genius. And um, how many of you know, I mean, maybe you don't, but for, you, know, you, you ask people, what is the hardest, one of, one of the hardest things for people to do, believe it or not, is public speaking. 
It's actually up there as one of the top three things that's the hardest thing to do, is to stand in front of a crowd and speak and talk. And um, a lot of people toss and turn wouldn't sleep if they felt that they had to get up and, uh, and speak in the morning. How many a, a dad give his daughter away and never ate the meal at the wedding because he had to speak? And, and, uh, and he just sort of couldn't, hadn't got the appetite uh, because they had to give a speech. Uh, afterwards or before so they, they, it's, it's just a difficult thing to do and many in the scriptures uh, depict that very reality that it's very very hard uh, to stand in front of multitudes with different ideas or perceptions or concepts or philosophies or ideals and speak because you know not everybody sees it you know that you're trying to bring people to a, a level that you understand that they possibly don't and so it, it, it it's different And as you look around the room you see all sorts of different responses too so it's a very difficult thing to do in fact jeremiah is going to complain about it and god tells him here listen when you do it here's what you don't do don't regard their faces because if you're going to go by the way they, they look and the expressions they give you never do it you got to look past them you got to look beyond where they're at. And so, um, for example here, in the book of Exodus in chapter 4, God had called Moses. Now Moses went up and screwed up the whole plan that God had. God had to delay it for a, a period of uh, 40 years. Uh, God had intended to deliver them some 30 years earlier, but Moses screwed it up 10 years too early, ran out, tried to do it himself, ended up in the backside of the desert for 40 years. Then God revisits him and said, are you ready? And he well yeah I am and he said well fine here's what I want you to do I want you to go in and talk to Pharaoh and he went what and he goes yeah you got to go back and talk to Pharaoh and then he started making excuses he thought God who wants to go back and talk to Pharaoh and so it says here Moses said unto the Lord oh my Lord I am not eloquent I, I, I find it very hard to speak I find it very hard to string words together I mean I'm as raw as they come and you got to remember he had the best education you can get He's the best education an Egyptian or a Jew can buy. He was very eloquent, but he's terrified of going back to speak to or in front of everybody, especially the nation of slaves that he's going back to deliver. He says, I'm not eloquent, neither hitherto for, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I'm also slow slow of speech. Or what it basically says is he, he had a st st stutter. And, and he, that's what he did. He, he, he let on. I have a, a slow, slow tongue. I can't get the words out. And he started to make excuses. Well, you know, later on during this discourse, uh, God turned around and said to him, okay, that's fine. But if you're willing to go, we'll take Aaron with you and Aaron can go be your mouthpiece. Huh? How about that? And that's what happened. So God wasn't listening to his excuses, although he had excuses. Now we know he wasn't a stammerer or a stutterer. He wasn't. And because and, the Bible says here, as Stephen, before he was stoned over in the book of Acts, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, as Stephen is given an, or, an, an oration about what the Jews and the Jewish leaders had done over time, he starts to ridicule them for where they're at. And he makes this statement under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He says this, And Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in word, and indeed, he said, nah, that kid, that, that guy back there, he was an awesome orator. He was an awesome speaker. He, he was eloquent in his delivery of the word and truth and what God had told him to do. But he made excuses because it's a hard thing to do. It's a difficult thing to stand in front of and, and declare and, and portray a, and communicate. Here's another guy, as I mentioned, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an awesome prophet and highly and mightily used of God during a period before they were taken into captivity and as they were taken into captivity, the, the tribe of Judah. And it says, And then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I'm a child. I'm infantile when it comes to my delivery, my discourse, my understanding. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whomsoever I command thee, you will speak. But be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Basically, I'm, I'm here to deliver you from the disgruntled. 
And he knew that. And he said, this would put you, if anything's going to put you off, it's the people. He said, but don't, don't never, never mind them. Then verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Very difficult thing to do. Um, and God had to anoint him to do it. And as far as Moses was concerned, God had to get Aaron to speak on his behalf. That was sort of the way it went. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, Paul the Apostle, a phenomenal theologian in his day as a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee of Pharisees, this individual talks about his oration skills. And, and you and I would think, well, you know what? He obviously was just eloquent. And I'm sure he was. I'd like to believe that he was. Certainly what he wrote and what was written by him and narrated to others to write down for him, like the Book of Romans and whatever, are just masterful masterpieces of discourse and, and argument and, and, and thought and process. And again, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But as to his oratory skills, he, he, he says something of himself here. He says, And I, brethren, I came... Uh, when I came to you, came not with excellency of, of speech or of wisdom. He said, I didn't come as a fine speaker. I didn't come to intellectualize you into the kingdom. A lot of times that's what we think we need to do with people. We need to go out and, and argue with everybody and tell them, you know, and be smarter than them. No, you just need to go out and live a life that they can't possibly live without the Holy Spirit. That's really what you need to do because you can't. You can talk a good talk, but walking the walk is a completely different thing. And that's what Paul was saying. I can come with eloquence of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I kept it simple. And, and I was with you in weakness and in fear. And tell you the truth, I was nervous. I was nervous when I got up to speak in front of you all. I was nervous when I started to talk to you about the things of God. I, I, I wasn't, you know, overly confident. I, 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 there was a, an awesomeness of, of inadequacy in my own being as to whether I would deliver the message correctly or not, because I knew the gravity of it. So he says, I, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words, of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest in how eloquent I spoke, but in a demonstration of the spirit of God. But again, I wanted you to see that Paul, you know, even when it came to public speaking, Paul did so in fear and trembling because of the gravity of what he did and, and of course, the opposition to why, what he was doing. It says here in the book of 1 Corinthians, and chapter 1 and verse 17, Paul, as they're arguing and fighting with each other, who to follow and do we follow this one, do we follow that one? And, and this was going on in the Corinthian church. And everybody was picking their favorites. And, and Paul said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Or basically what he was saying was, it, it, you know, I don't have to be a great orator, I have to be willing to be used of God, but you know, you don't have to have master's degrees or whatever. You just open your mouth and tell your story is what he was basically saying. And so again, he's describing his words. He's describing the manner in which he spoke to people. And he was also describing his weakness and his fear, his trembling when he did as an orator. So let me give you a definition of what oration is in, in its true sense. A communicator, orator, and wordsmith. I don't know if you've ever heard those terminologies. A wordsmith is just somebody who's eloquent with words, eloquent with concepts and principles, and has the ability to pull them together and make them understandable. Uh, true teaching is um, taking very complicated issues and making them very simple. That's really what, it, what teaching is. And again, always remember, teaching is not based on the skill alone of the teacher, but on the student's ability to pass the test. So if you get up there and you think you're ever so eloquent and you're gabbing away and you're using all these words, and people say, oh my goodness, I mean, wow. And, and then it comes to the student doing the test and they all fail. Well, nobody learned anything in that class. He just got to spout or she just got to rattle on. So it's not about uh, the, 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 
eloquence of speech, more so than the skill set of, of uh, and the command of understanding and bringing understanding to people. And so the wordsmiths, a public speaker, especially one who is eloquent and skilled, or one distinguished for skill in the power of public speaking. You know, when they get up there and start to speak, they just, they're good at it. They do well at it. They excel at it. You ask somebody else to get up and talk and they flounder or flutter or, you know, leave half of the points out and if you don't write it down and it's not there before them, they just never get it out and then when they come down, they left the half of it unsaid and so on and so forth. And so this is one distinguished in, for skill in public uh, or the power as a public speaker. Communicative abilities. This ability to communicate a thought or a concept or a precept. They have an ability to, to make it simple and understandable. Languages. Oration is also included in being able to speak, not just the language of the culture, as, as that can mean too, but to actually be able to speak different languages, to communicate with other peoples from maybe different cultures. Um, skilled in communicating what one needs to hear. They just have a way of being able to answer all your questions. They just have a way of just being able to make you think, oh, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. And they just have a wonderful way of, of enabling or making you think that you have the answer. It, and it may just be, I don't know if any of you ever got into an argument with somebody who's great at words, and you just, no matter how right you are, you are always lose. You always lose. Us guys are great at that. Yeah. Well, you always lose, and, and you always make them feel like they didn't know, or they didn't understand, or at the end of it, they look and think, I don't even know what you said, but you know what, I don't even want you to go over it again. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just willing to just succumb and say, yeah, you're probably right, even though I don't agree with you. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the skilled in communicating what you need to hear. Huh. No, it wasn't my fault. No, I never got lost. I knew exactly where I was. I just came down this way, just for sightseeing purposes. Uh, I'll, I'll find our way out. Uh, whatever. They just make you feel, they, they, you, they, they tell you what you need to hear, really. Exchange ideas, information, and news. Eloquent in discourse, debate, and conversation. They, they, can, they can talk. Talk about anything. This is, this is what oration is. And we're going to find out that this individual, the Antichrist, is awesome. He's an awesome orator. He's an awesome communicator. This guy can speak cross cultures, cross languages. Uh, he can speak across denominations. He can speak across the aisle. The guy knows how to say what you need to hear. And he's skilled at it. Very skilled at it. So, Jesus himself, of course, being the word, he was very eloquent in what he done. It says here, and it came to pass that after three days, this is when Jesus was missing at 12 years of age, it says, they came and they found him in the temple. He's only 12. Sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them. These are doctors of the law. These are guys that have spent their whole lifetime meditating on learning, word for word learning the scriptures. They could quote any scripture, any verse. And so it says here, that's what they did. He's sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Jesus had this eloquency, this communicative skill, this ability to speak across culture, to speak to everybody, to bring understanding, to bring... A, to, to the four, what they needed to hear, in truth, that is, not, not deceptively, but truthfully. He was very skilled in words, very skilled with his word. And at 12 years of age, he had no problem sitting, talking to the people, using words. Because we're a word species, you've got to remember that. Words are mega important to all of us. If we're not saying them, we're reading them. If it's not a book you're reading, it's a sign you read or a direction you're being given, uh, or an information from a, you know, a menu or something. It's all words. We're a word species. 
and, and so to talk to or influence or minister to any generation it's predominantly done with words even the signs and wonders only validate a uh, give vindication to the words that are spoken so jesus would preach on the kingdom and then he'd demonstrate it with signs and wonders he didn't do signs and wonders to convince them he did signs and wonders to convince them of the word that he spoke but words are very very important so it's very necessary for uh, anyone who's going to deceive the world or convince the world whether it be jesus or an antichrist that they have eloquency in being a wordsmith and being able to communicate skills in in oratory discourse everybody with me so it says they heard they were astonished at his understanding and answers he was gifted gifted when it came to speaking it says in matthew the seventh chapter in verse 28 it says and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, that the people were astonished at his doctrine. His doctrine was different than the Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees and Sadducees and doctors of the law would debate the scriptures. Well, you know, we think, we believe. I've been studying for the last, you know, 25 years, and we believe that the Torah says this, or we believe that this means that, and we're convinced that Isaiah the prophet was talking about it, but nobody had any certainty. They were all sort of endeavoring to, unless they came under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, where he would take control, but... And, and that was basically what the prophets were. But these doctors of the law basically all had, a, you know, a, an opinion. That's what a rabbi was. He was a teacher. And people sort of followed him and followed his teachings. Jesus wasn't a doctor of the law, but they called him rabbi, a teacher. He hadn't been to rabbinical school in the sense of he didn't go off and, and, and do what these other rabbis and scribes uh, had done. He was off as a builder. Um, the word there, carpenter, in Scripture is not the word carpenter, it's the word builder. He was a builder with his dad, and, or his foster dad. And so that's what he did. And um, so they were amazed that this guy, how could this guy know what he did without having been to rabbinical school? How could this guy understand what he understands? And all he was was a bricklayer, you know, in, in one of the cities, you know, 15 miles away from Bethlehem uh, or Nazareth. You know, how, how can he be so smart? How does he know this stuff? Well, the thing about it was, he is the word. So where the other guys were saying, well, my opinion was, he wasn't saying my opinion was, he says, this is what it means. And they were going, what? He goes, yeah, that's what it means. And he taught, unlike the others, it wasn't an opinion. It was, this is the way it is. This is what God said. This is what God meant. This is how it means. And that's the way Jesus spoke. They were astonished. He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes, because they didn't know. They were all winging it. He wasn't winging it. He had great oratory skills. It says here in John 7, in verse 15, And the Jews marveled, saying, How know this man letters, having never been to rabbinical school? How can this guy quote scriptures? How can this guy quote verses and, and triangulate all of these concepts into truth? And he's never been to, never done it. So, I mean, it wasn't just the, 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 the doctors of the law. It, it was everybody, including the nation of Israel who'd heard the scribes and Pharisees teach them all of their lifetime. They never heard anything like it. Never did. Never. They, their, it, they, their head went tilt every time the guy spoke. He was a tremendous communicator. Had to be. In John 7, 45, it says, Then came the officers of the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they said unto them, Why have you not brought him or arrested him? And the officers answered and said, We just stood listening to what the guy was saying. We just never heard anybody speak like this before. They went down to arrest him and they became the audience themselves. They went down to take him captive and they just listened to the guy and thought, what are we arresting this guy for? He's right. He was brilliant in his oratory, oratory skills. And, and again, you have to be. If you want to turn or control or captivate or lead or guide or reveal truth to, you have to be able to use words. 
Words are so important. The Antichrist is going to be just as skilled with words, but all for the purpose of deluding, deceiving, and controlling, and manipulating people. But he's, net, he's going to have to be skilled with words. You can't have somebody who's shy. You can't have somebody who doesn't want to stand out in front of the crowd. You can't have somebody that sits in, in the background all the time and gets somebody else to do it. This guy's up front, in your face, highly intelligent, and an awesome speaker. Awesome, like none other. The only person like him was Jesus, really. This guy is brilliant when it comes to communicating language, ideas, experience, intent, purposes, understandings. This guy can do it. He's brilliant at it. It says here in Daniel, in chapter 7, concerning this individual, when it addresses him, talks about him being such a bolster and arrogant. Gosh, there's nothing so annoying as somebody arrogant. But the thing about this arrogancy is you can't argue with him because he's so intellectually brilliant. And as much and all as you'd like to say, nah, I don't think you're right, he had this wonderful way of being able to take your wrongness and make, or your rightness and make you feel wrong, even though you were right. And he twists you into his words and he weaves words so well that after a while you don't even know what your argument was in the first place. Did you ever get into an argument with somebody who's so intellectually skillful with their own debate that when you talk with them, they, I don't even know what the argument was about. I used to, in school, I used to be on the debating team. And you know, we did that for years. And I used to love, I love a good argument. Uh, and until I met Lucy, and then that put an end to arguing altogether. <laughs> yeah, too many, too many. Anyway, um, I lost too many. <laughs> And any one I won, I had to pay for it, so I wasn't worth it. So your best, I was just a lose. Um, but you know, when, when you go in for a debate, you, you, you know, you do pro or con, and they give you, you know, what you had to, what you had to train yourself up on, and, and the, the pros that you had to write concerning it, even though you didn't believe it. I mean, you know, they'd bring up a subject and say, hey, you know, use our pro. So I don't really believe that. And they say, well, that's the debate. So you now had to take the argument for something that you didn't even believe in. So you had to be skillful in convincing the audience that you believed in it, even though you didn't, and argue for it, even though you didn't think it was true. And so you had to get up there and convince your audience and the adjudicators that you believed in it, and you tried to demise or undermine the argument of the opponent and destroy their, their argument, even though you believed what they believed. And many times we won and walked away thinking, I don't know how I've done that because I didn't believe it myself. But we did it nonetheless. And that's what, that's what I'm talking about, this ability to, to just debate and argue with words. This guy, is he, this is what he does. It says, And of the ten horns that were in the head, and the other which came up, and before whom the other three fell, even that horn that had eyes, that's intellect, intelligence, smartness, and a mouth, that spake very great things, whose look was more stout. He was haughty. He was more stout than anybody else. He knew he was smart. He knew how intelligent he had it. And he knew he was a wordsmith when it came to words and argument and oration and debate and language and concepts. And he was brilliant. He knew it. And he knew if you got into an argument with him, he was going to he was going to wrap you up in, in smartness and wisdoms that you, because the guy could answer dark questions. He could ask you a question that you couldn't answer. And that would stifle you right there and then. So you come along and say, well, I don't agree with you. And you say, well, you're hey, 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 tell me what about this? Well, if you're so smart, what about that? Well, I don't know about that. Well, see, well, I do. Well, that's you beat. That's one nil. You know, one to zero, and then another one, two to zero. And then by three to zero, you don't want to argue with him anymore because this guy's making a show of you. This is what he does. He's haughty. He's smart. He is boastful, and he's got a mouth that speaks great things. He's a boaster, haughty, arrogant. In Daniel 7, 25, it says, And he spake great words, even against God. 
This guy saw out there with his words and his attitude and, and, and his temperament that he's even speaking against God. He thinks he's that clever and that smart. And he shall wear out the saints. But obviously he's talking about wear them out with his mouth. He's not making them do exercise. All right, give me 10. He's not doing any of that stuff. He's wearing them out with his words. They're coming to him saying, but, 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 for the first three and a half years, he's going to sign a peace agreement with Israel. They're going to rebuild the temple. They're going to think he's the Messiah. They're going to receive him. When Jesus said over in John 5, I come in my own name, but then there's a guy coming after me, and when he comes, I come in my own name, you reject me, but there's another guy coming, and he comes in his own name, and you're going to swallow hook, line, and sinker. He's going to come as the Messiah, and you're going to swallow it. And this treaty that he's going to make, and then any argument or anybody that would think for a minute, hey, didn't I read about somebody like you? He's going to wear them out, wear them out, wear them out. I don't know if any of you have ever known anybody that wore you out with their words. <laughs> I'm afraid of my life to speak. This is a very dangerous subject. I can tell you. <laughs> We're all the men in the room. And then, you know, women have this other skill. It sort of it reciprocates man's argumentative skills, and and you know I know when I talk about this, many women will say, "Oh, you're just I know who you're talking about there," and then what is that's all about? But then there's another narrative also that that describes it as drip, 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 and, and I won't get into that one, but that's in Proverbs as well. So it sort of works both ways. Um, but it's, it's words. Liz uh, not here to defend that. Oh, I know she's not. This is great. This is why I'm speaking so eloquently <laughs> and boldly. <laughs> if she ever listens to it, I'll end up with this eye closed like it has been many <laughs> times. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. Um, he spaced great words against the, the Most High. He will wear them out. He'll wear the saints out with his words, his arguments. You just can't out-talk the guy. And every time you come, he'll have an answer. Every time you come, he'll put you down. Every time you come, he'll twist your words and you'll walk away thinking, what was the point? To the point where you won't do it anymore. That's what he's talking about. He, the guy's skillful in argument and debate. It says, and he will think to change times and laws, or that's um, the uh, religious laws of the Jews. He, he come in and say, now, you know what, we're, we're, I'm thinking we're going to change that sabbath -y thing. Well, God said that. Never mind God. I'm able to do this. Hey, look, let me show you that God's with me. And boom, you'll do lying signs and wonders. And then you'll have some of these guys come and say, but you know what? Listen, you can't really do that. And he's going to wear them out. He's going to wear them out. He's going to wear them out with his words. And that's what he does. To think to change times and laws that they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of times or the three and a half years. But this guy is going to challenge everything and wear people out that try to correct him to the point that they won't even argue with him. In Daniel 11.37 it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above everybody. Hey, this guy thinks, feels, acts, sounds like he's untouchable. And, he, and you won't. You just will not be able to argue with the guy. He's just brilliant. He's a brilliant orator, a brilliant speaker, a brilliant communicator. He's not average. He's not your average individual. Jesus was like him. And he's a counterfeit of what Jesus was. It's really what it is. So he's brilliant. You can see why people will yield to him. He's so smart and he's so smooth with his words. He's brilliant with his words. So he'll magnify himself above everybody, above every one. Revelation 12, 2, and I, I said this, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were like the feet of the bear. And we talked about all of that when we did the book of Daniel. It says, but his mouth was the mouth of a lion. So anybody want to describe what and why we depict somebody or any individual as a lion? 
the roar of a lion, the king of the jungle, the, the king of all beasts. Well, the Bible actually says that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The Bible says over in, in 1 Peter 5 that the devil goes around as. Not, he isn't one. He'd like to be one. He, pre he, he pretends that he is. And his roar really isn't that, that loud. I always said this when I read that verse, the shadow of a dog never bit anybody. The shadow of an Irish wolfhound certainly will not inflict any injury. But the shadow may look great. I mean, you get behind it and put enough illumination behind it, you can have a shadow that's much bigger than the dog is. And so you see this thing walking into a room and you realize that the dog's not that big. It's only a little puppy. But when it walks in and the sun gets behind it or it's illuminated correctly, it makes it look on the wall like it's a huge beast. But the reality of it is it's just a little puppy, you know, walking in front of a, you know, a high intensity lamp or something. And it throws a shadow. That's what that means. He goes around as a shadow trying to pretend that he's something that he's not. Looks bigger than he is. And this guy does the same. He is the mouth of a lion. He's roaring, he's bragging, he's talking, he's, he, he, he's, he, he's all mouth. He's all mouth. And he's brilliant at it, that's the thing. And there's nobody that is as mouthy as him or can shut him down. He's brilliant. Second Thessalonians, and chapter 2 and verse 4, and I just wrote braggadocious. I hope I spelled it right. But braggadocious. You know what I mean by braggadocious? You're all checking braggadocious out now, aren't you? And some of you don't know how it's spelled either, so that makes, that makes a few of us. But anyway, uh, braggadocious means it's always about him. It's always about him. You can talk about something or say something, say, well, I knew that. I mean, I, you know, I was just thinking that the other day. You know what? That came to me some years ago. So I just, I'm only after learning it this morning. Nah, I knew that years ago. I mean, I remember that. I was so easy to remember that. I mean, just sort of came across when I was reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, I read that in a week. Uh, and then I read it backwards just for the challenge of it. Um, and then I read it in four other languages. So, okay, all right, but that's the end of my argument. I ain't arguing with the guy. This guy's so braggadocious. It's all about him. It's all about how great I am and wonderful I am, what I know, what I understand. And so it says, who opposes it and exalts himself. It's all about him. He's so self-centered. And yet when you get around him, you, you, you don't get a word in edgeways. You can't. If you get in his environment, in his, in his, in his circle, he, he's just, it's all about him. He's the center of it and anybody around him sort of, are all shut down, you can't speak, it's all about him. They'll just follow him, they'll just idolize the guy, they'll just, I mean, they'll treat him like he's a messiah. That's really what they're going to do. You can't, can I talk to the guy? He says he'll, he'll exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so whatever you worship, he'll demand you worship him. He's after worship. And he'll convince you that he's the one that needs to be, not God. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple, showing himself that I am God. Hey, you're looking at him. It's me. It's all about me. I know everything. And there won't be anybody smart enough to shut him down. The guy... He's brilliant. He's a brilliant speaker. Daniel eleven twenty one, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably. Oh, the guy's brilliant. He knows how to, he, he's not just arrogant. and he, He's smart with his words. He'll come in peaceably. He'll butter them up. He'll befriend them. He'll tell them what they need to know. He'll communicate what they need to hear. He'll be all with them. He'll be all for them. They'll think, oh, he's my friend. Hey, you know I know you, man. Oh, you don't? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're friends. Friends. Yeah, I was just texting him the other day. He texts me back. I want to see the text. He says I'm, I'm a, he says I'm a friend of his. Oh, really? Yeah. 
He's uh, he, he's my buddy, and you know what? I, I don't mind what people say about him. He's a great. He just win you over. How many of you have ever been told about somebody or whatever, and, and, and you just get around them, and they just they, they defuse all of your animosity and things? Oh, he's not that bad. I mean, from what if I was to listen to everybody, I would have thought, my goodness, he's this, he's that, he does this, does that. He's a vile individual. He's the nicest person you ever met. I was in the room with him, he, and he saw me, and he said, Hey, Tim, how are you doing, Tim? And I thought, how does he know my name? And he goes, Hey, Tim, come up here, come up here. Hey, here's my pal, Tim. Tim said, I never met him before. But boy, I'll tell you what, when I went back to work, everybody came over and said, hey, Tim, I didn't know you knew him. Well, you know, I just, just a friend. We just text every so When he needs to know something, he, he texts me and I, and I help him. Guy's brilliant. He'll obtain the kingdom with flatteries. You know what flattery is? You're awesome. You are brilliant. You're, you know, I mean, there's nobody like you. Everybody sort of loves that. He butters people up. He knows how to do that too. He can put you down, but he can butter you up too. He's brilliant at what he does. It says here in Daniel eleven thirty two, And such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God and be strong, they will be convinced. But everybody else, he'll butter them up. There'll be a people who won't listen to him. They'll understand who it is and what it is, but everyone else, he'll tell you what you want to hear. He'll tell you what you need to hear. He's not just got the ability to stand his ground and put you down. He has the ability to infiltrate your soul by flatteries, build you up and make you your defenses come down. Yes, sir? Thanks for the question. Just Mm. People use humor and twist it in a way that Excuse you me. laugh at it and then they pull you into that ideology. That Absolutely. He, he's a wordsmith. He's brilliant with words. So when he meets every individual, if he needs to put one down, he'll put him down. But if he needs to build one up and, and work his way into something, he knows how to do that too. He knows how to tell you what you need to hear. And so you come on the television, it's like, you know, you see interviews on the television every day and they come out and tell you what you need to hear. They keep you happy for the next two weeks until it all changes and then they come out and tell you what you need to hear. And they calm everybody down and then you say, well, it's not working. And then we come out and we tell you what you need to hear. And that's what we do. It's called management. And he knows how to manage. He knows how to manage relationships and countries and whatever. This guy will get in among leaders and he will flatter them and then he will steal, as it says, you come in peaceably and obtain the kingdoms around him because he's going to butter everybody up, get in on the inside with everybody, and then he's going to come in and conquer them. Then he's going to come in and destroy them. And there's nothing they can do. He sort of, he's the Trojan horse. He does it with words. So, um, it says here, uh, I, as, as Solomon was talking about he uses this example here of um, man's ego, really. And he says, To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flatters with her words. And he really is talking about a young man being, this is a, a young man being taken captive and destroyed by his own ego. And, and he meets this harlot on the street and she bats her eyelids and you know, she gives him that look and he's thinking, oh, I can't, well, you know. And then she says, oh, I've been waiting for you all night long. And he goes, what? I mean, you're so out of my league. I mean, I could not She goes, I know, but just like a man, you're so muscular. And before you know it, the guy's going, do you think so? And she's going, yes. And you are, you're so handsome. And he goes, I never thought I was. And, and he's looking at her and she's thinking, and she's gorgeous. And and he's just hearing what he wants to hear. And his whole rationale, his whole reasoning mechanism just collapses. And, and it just tumbles, it just crumbles. And she knows how to do it with flatteries. And before you know it, he's caught, hook, line, hook, line and sinker. And she has him. 
and she wins him because she's playing to his ego and the flatteries tear him down. That's what he, that's what the Antichrist does. He plays to their ego until he has them. And once he got them, they can't get away. Or it says again in, in Proverbs 7 and verse 5, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger with the flatteries of her words. Flattery is saying something but endeavoring, using it for another purpose. That's what he does. And he's brilliant at it. It says here in Proverbs also, a man with flatteries, who, or who flatters his neighbor, is spreading a net for his feet. See, when people start to butter you up, you better watch out. Because they could be looking for something. There could be, they, the words are nice, you like the words, but there may be another intention behind them. And the words may only be an excuse to you to drop your yard. That's what this means. This guy is brilliant at it. He's an expert at it. He'll get in there with governments and governors and, and financiers and intellectuals, and he'll butter them up if he has to, or he'll tear them down if he has to. He can do it either way. He's a wordsmith. He's brilliant. He's brilliant at his words. Everybody okay? Here's this guy called Absalom. Do you remember the story of he was David's son? And he wanted to turn the nation against his father. So here's what he done. It says, it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared his chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. I mean, his dad didn't even do that. But he tried to make himself out to be something he wasn't. But he impressed everybody. Oh, look, he's got 50 guys running in front of his chariot. It must be important. Hey, he's got a flag on his car. Oh, I saw a car go through Alpharetta this morning. There was two flags on it. One of them was the American flag. I can't remember what country it was on the other one. But that must have been an important person. And there was two outriders on motorcycles from the Alpharetta Police Department. And they were stopping all the traffic. I wonder who that was. Must be very important people. That's what Absalom was doing. So it says here, and, and, and 50 men before him. And Absalom rose up early, stood beside the way of the gate or the entrance of the city where people came and went and went. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for a judgment, then Absalom called on to him and said, hey, of, of, of what? What's your problem? And what's, what's the deal? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy masters are good and right, but there is no man to dispute to the king or to hear you. The gate was where sort of the governor and the judges were. And people had to dispute. They came in and said, oh, I'm a, you know, I've got a problem. And so and so went and took me. You know, my land, or they took some of my sheep, or whatever, and they go to a judge, and the judge had, and Absalom said, You know, your problem is, though, you really don't have anybody to go to the king on your behalf. I'm his son. I mean, you tell me what the problem is. I'll, I'll have a word with dad. We'll sort this out. You tell me, I'll tell dad, and we'll get it sorted. Oh, you would? I, no, it's not a problem. Be glad to do it. Be glad. Where is it you're from? Yeah, I knew your dad. I know your father's father. I heard about him. Great people. Lovely, lovely people. Yeah, listen, leave it with me. I, I'll help you. So the guy walks with him. That Absalom guy is such a lovely guy. Absalom had another intent, but he was winning them over with words. It goes on to say, and in uh, uh, verse four, and, and Absalom said, moreover, uh, "Oh, that I were the judge in the land." And that every man which had a suit or a cause might come on to me, and, and I'd do him justice. He said, hey, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not a judge. I, I mean, I wish I was, but of course I want to run for election. I mean, if you want to put me up for election, I'd be glad of your vote. But nonetheless, I do appreciate the under... Oh, he's such an awesome... If he comes up for election, I'm voting for him. He goes on to say, and it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took it and kissed him. And on that manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for ju judgment. And Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. How did he steal it? Flatteries. 
This guy's brilliant at it. Brilliant. He that hated disassembled it with his lips, and the lying, uh, sorry, and layeth up the seat within him. For he speaketh fair, believe him not. Sorry, when he speaketh fair, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. It says, Who, whose hatred is covered up by deceit, his wickedness shall he, uh, sorry, yes, yeah, shall, shall be showed before the whole congregation. This guy, he dissembles with his words. He just tear you down, just break you down, word for brick by brick, argument by argument, offense by offense. He'll just take them all away to the point where he has you. It's a skill. The Antichrist has it. Draw not, sorry, draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbor, but mischief is in their hearts. You can be saying one thing with your words and totally intentionally doing something different, but using words for that skill. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. I mean, it just went down. It's like one of them, you know, um, cakes that you buy in the, in, um, in what do you call that, uh, uh, cookie place that they have, famous in America. I know, I know it's called a bakery, but, no, there's, at the, you go to the airport, Lucy's all, Cinnabon. Oh, wicked, wicked. Like a and, and a Krispy Kreme, another demonic activity. <laughs> because when you lift it up, it's so light. And then when you take a bite of it, it's, I can eat four of these. It'll do me no harm. One problem is when it goes in, it gets heavier. And it gets that heavy, then it distorts the whole figure. And then you think, oh, what has me this way? He was a Cinnabon. It was Krispy Kremes. It goes down smooth, but then you have to deal with it later. So easy to eat it. It's so appetizing. It's so I need it. I love it. Yeah, tell me more. Problem is, when you take it in, you have to deal with getting it off. And that's what this means. His words, his words will be smoother than butter. You think I could listen to him for hours. I mean, just, well, What's he saying? Oh, there he's on the team. I'll just, shh, 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 I want to hear him. Problem is, when you take in what he's saying and it goes down smoothly, it affects you long after it's stopped and you have to deal with it. This guy is an intellectual genius, but he's an oratory genius as well. He is so skillful, so smart. This idea that he'll come along and, you know, people, he'll have to force people to, no, 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 this guy, he is, is this, he, he's called the lie. He's called the deceiver. He's brilliant at it. And you can see why the world will follow him. It would be really easy to follow the guy. Really, really easy. So this idea that, you know, he's some gargoyle type individual and so wicked it'll be obvious and so mean and whatever that people say, oh, I know, I know who he is. Now, he's a deceiver. He's, a, he's the lie. He's going to be so brilliant that you'll, he'll, you'll hear what you need to hear. He'll win you whatever way he needs to win you. You need to have your smarts up. You need to be intentional in your understanding because this guy is going to, if he doesn't win you, he'll wear you out. And this is how he's going to control what he does in the time that he, that he does in this, this period. So, has anybody got any questions on this at this juncture? You think he'll be a politician? Um, he's going to be a political genius. He's going to be a political, I'll show you that. So, he will certainly have influence over politics. Because he understands so much. Because he's able to solve issues. Well, what about global warming? <laughs> oh, don't panic. Here's what we're going to do. He's a genius. How smart was that? And hey, you in the oil industry? Hey, we've got another use for it. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, 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 no. 
No, listen, we're all going electric. Electric's okay. But the oil industry isn't over. I found another reason for using it. And it ain't going to cloud up the sky. And it ain't going to, what? Yes, absolutely. Because we found a new technology and we need the oil. Oh, wow. I mean, he solved that one too. So we don't even have to shut down the coal mines or anything like that. We, he found another use for fossil fuel, but it's, it's used in a different way. He's brilliant. This guy is brilliant. Now, we won't be around when he's doing his stuff, strutting his stuff. But I want you to understand, he's going to be so easy to follow at the time. He's going to be so easy to swallow up countries and kingdoms and nations and people and intellectuals and scientists. And he, he's, he's going to be bringing that. He's a great, yes. What runs in my head earlier was that this is post-pre-tribulation. But, you know, just to make it through that piece, you know, with all the persecution, physical, whatever, you're dealing with this, that under those circumstances, how easy would it be to acquiesce to... Oh, yeah. You know, the first three and a half years, he's doing all this stuff. He's, he's, he's traveling the world. He's buttering people up. He's, he's taking down arguments and, and winning entry into systems and countries and nations and, and, and circles. And he, the, the first three and a half years, he's peace. I mean, everybody thinks he's great. It's not until he walks in in the, in the middle of that tribulation, because the first half is called the tribulation and the last half is called the great tribulation. So when he's going to walk in in the middle of the tribulation and he's going to sit in the temple which the Jews will build because of the covenant that he has with them or he's arranged with Palestine. They're going to take the temple off the mount and they're going to put, they're going to take that mosque that's there out and they're going to put the temple either on the same spot or right beside it. I don't know what they're going to do, but they're all going to agree to it. And he's going to sit in there, and the Bible says when he sits in there in front of CNN and ABC and all of these different people and says, oh, by the way, listen, just making an announcement, I'm God. He said, that's it, you just better run. And not every nation in the world is going to succumb to him. He's not going to, he's not going to succumb, but all hell will break loose. That's when the tribulation, that's when the mark comes. That's when he starts to control uh, commerce and industry and governments, and that's when the wars all start. Um, but yeah, it's very, very. He's 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 the best there there is. Yes, ma'am. So for the rational media taking a big war all the time. Uh -huh. This is just a random question. But what are what is everyone else's left on there? What are people going to think happens? Like, is there any sense of that in scripture? Like, well, let me put it to you this way: If the church had been taken out, if the rapture had to happen through COVID. Everybody would have said, we were all killed. And they wouldn't have cared less. In fact, some people would have said, I'm glad they're gone. Because there were hypocrites and this, that, and the other. And I don't believe that the church is going to go out like that. I do believe that the church has yet to see its most glorious days as a powerful entity demonstrating the kingdom of God and all of the attributes of that kingdom in a world that is looking for governance. And hopefully the greatest revival we'll see in in in. Uh, in a lifetime is because of where the church is going right now. Um, I think that when they are extracted, when they are taken, there'll be such a divide between the world as it is right now. For example, there's so much hatred right now for anything that's moral. And the Bible says, you know, even those who hold to the truth will be targeted in the street. So when you turn around and say, well, that's wrong, People, the woke society were trying to say, well, we're not buying your stuff anymore. You, you're sacked. Uh, you may have been the, the coach of a team, but hey, we found something that you wrote, you know, 10 years ago. There was a slur on, you're a racist, you're out. They've done that. They just did that recently uh, with some NFL guy. And uh, they do stuff like that. That's the way they operate. And they'll take you out. And so... Um, I think that the, when the church are extracted, they, there'll be a people in the world that'll be glad to see the back end of them. I say, well, thank God they're gone. But there'll be another crowd that'll realize now that they're gone, we're in trouble because we've been told and they'll know better. And then there'll be other people who are glad they're gone are going to listen to this other character because he's going to come to the fore then. 
and he's going to start bringing all these answers, the answer to cancer, the answer to AIDS, the answer to this, the answer to that, and the global warm and fossil fuels, peace between Israel and, oh, the guy is brilliant. And he'll preoccupy the world with all of this other stuff. And I'd like to think they're really going to miss us. I hope that they do. I hope that they do. Yeah, they don't even know why they... You're beginning to see how easy it is to control the world through media and a narrative. Words. Wear this. Don't wear this. Do wear. Wear two. Wear three. No, don't wear any. No, they don't work, but wear them anyway. Don't wear... And, and, and here... So I'm up, I'm down. Stand up, sit, sit down, sit, sit down, sit down, sit down. Stand up now. Okay, we're all sit No, 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 sit down. Okay, we're all sit down. Stand up. Okay, we're all stand up. And after a while, yeah. they don't even question. Am I standing or sitting? Uh, you're standing today. Okay, we're all standing. <laughs> Why are you sitting? You should be standing. No, I don't want to stand. Well, they said we should be standing. Well, we were standing last week and they told us to sit. Now they're telling us to stand. Well, you need to do it. For everybody in the room, you need to stand. So now we're all fighting with each other. Well, we don't know. Stop it, Michelle. You're, you're. Even, stop it, Michelle. You're a racist. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand? That's what we do. We put them. We put each other down when it, when it doesn't suit us, and that's what wokeism is doing. As I said to you before, and I'll say it again: the greatest woke establishment in the world is the church. Speak in tongues? No, you speak, don't speak in tongues. You believe in this, you don't believe in that. You're part of them, you're this and all, and we won't even talk to one another. We need to get over this and get on with the message and the mission that we have. We need to get rid of this wokeism even in the church. It's horrible. It's just a ploy to keep us all... Divided. Yeah. yeah, there's words for it. I don't even want to use them. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's it's... It's scary, but you can see it. You know, if you hadn't said this 20 years ago, I mean, it was Hitler, it was this, that, and the other, and you know, but now to see, to see the world being governed by media, see the world being governed by fear, it's all about fear, by the way. God does everything by faith, the devil, even the devil's hierarchy, you know, principalities, powers, might, dominion, the spiritual wickedness in heaven, that is all tears of fear. And the greater ones and the, the most evil of them are, they run the rest of them by fear. It's how it works, right down to little peons at the bottom. But they're, they're the other ones, as you go higher up, they're, they're more fear filled, fearful characters, creatures, individuals. Um, and so he's going to run by fear. And when COVID came out, for example, the, unfortunately, the church, many in the church, ran like the rest of the world did in the same fear. Truly. And I'm not saying we're not talking about common sense or not getting whatever or, or, or taking the, the appropriate steps to take care of yourself. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the fear of, I might die, it may be over. Uh, what am I going to do? Where, that's the fear I'm talking about, not, not the actions that we take to protect ourselves. I mean, uh, if I take, you know, Tylenol, am I in fear of, you know, getting a brain hair? I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the medical decisions we made or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about us being afraid of life like the rest of the people in life were afraid. That's all. Um, and we should have been bolder. We should have been more confident, knowing that whatever decisions we make, that they are fine because we all make decisions medically in different reasons. You know, I've got this, got to get you know, surgery on that. They're all decisions we make. But our fear of life and death and our fear of the world in which we live in, we shouldn't live with that fear. There should be a greater confidence in us, the greater seed that's in us than anything that's going on in the world. And whatever it is, no matter what it looks like, God's still going to take care of us. It doesn't mean that we don't make choices in life, and that's not what I'm talking about when I say the church were in fear. What I'm saying is the church just sounded fearful like everybody else in the world did. And we had a great opportunity to have a different narrative, not make different decisions, but, necessarily, but make, have at least a different 
voice in the middle of it all. And we did, and then we got shut down. You're not allowed, you, you stop. You, and, and you're not even allowed praise God anymore, okay? Unless you're wearing a mask. And, and you, you understand what I'm saying? So, um, all right, enough said. Um, any other questions on that? Everybody okay? All right. Uh, we take up another aspect of it next week. Um, uh, please remember our men's group on Tuesday morning. We are dealing with uh, money, God's optic on it. Uh, and we started a new series on uh, last Thursday night here um, on, uh, on planning. Um, you know, the greatest, you, did you know that the greatest act of faith, and we're all into faith and the spookiness of believing God, the greatest act of faith you can act is to make a plan. To make a plan about something that isn't means you believe that it can be, or that it will be, or that it is. But to sit around and kiss or ask around, God will do it. One day God will. Maybe God will show up. I'm believing God will. That's not faith. But to sit down and believe that God will and God's going to, or something that you, and then write a plan for it, God can work with that. But God cannot work with you or I declaring things that he's able to do. God knows what he's able to do. But if you believe that he is, you'll, write, you'll make a plan for it. And so we're dealing with planning. Um, and so it, it's, an, it's an important subject, very, very important. A lot of people just don't understand time and they let it pass them by. You've got to be making plans.